On an event like this, uh, experience like this is certainly a unique one for fans, especially of the Tigers and of Ernie Harwell. Uh, how did this whole idea come up in your mind to, to a production like this? Actually, Ernie asked me before he died if I'd be interested in doing like a movie or something like that about his life. And I didn't really think a movie would be appropriate because movies are very much about explosions and violence and sex and all that, and that's definitely not Ernie Harwell. But then, unfortunately, he got sick and, uh, you know, weren't able to really complete the project. After he passed away, the following summer, I was sort of uh, sitting in my basement and I just felt that I had never really fulfilled that promise and I felt a little bad about it, so I just began writing a play. I mean, no one was waiting for it, there was no production team, we didn't have any contracts, there was nothing. It was just something that I, I wrote over the course of a long summer in my basement and came out with it and said, well, it's not bad, let's give it a shot, maybe we'll run it for like three weeks in Detroit. I found a theater in Detroit. We cast some actors. We had no idea if there'd be much of a following for it at all. And it was scheduled to run for three weeks. And um, it's now in its fifth year. And it's the longest uh, running or most seen play in the history of Detroit theater. So I, I can't really claim that I had any uh, clue about that. But I think it speaks to the love of Ernie Harwell and baseball. And that's what the play's about. What, and you got to know him uh, when he was here with us. So what made him, you know, we hear his voice on the radio all the time, but in your one-on-one -on -one exchanges with him, what made him the type of guy that was worthy of a tribute like this? Well, um, first of all, he may be like the most perfect human being ever to walk the planet, uh, short of Jesus and, you know, probably a few others. But what makes him worthwhile as a subject for a play is that he really spanned the American romance with baseball. He grew up, when you listen to baseball strictly on the radio, there's a great story in the play about how he listened with like little cat whiskers on a battery and, and you know, with an earpiece, when baseball was magical and you never got a chance to see it. And he, he, he broke the color line barrier along with Jackie Robinson. He was there for that. He was there for Bobby Thompson's home run shot or heard around the world. He, he was here when television took over and radio started to move to the background. He was there with all the great Tigers teams. He was there when Tiger Stadium, you know, one of the oldest stadiums in the league was knocked down. You know, he, he, he sort of lived there. That was his home that they were knocking down. So as you follow Ernie's life, you follow baseball in the 20th century, essentially. And so it made for this great parallel, this romance between him and the game, him and his wife Lulu, and the audience and him. And I don't think I've ever met a more beloved human being. And uh, every story that you tell in the play, uh, when Ernie talks about it or the boy gets it out of him, the other character, you can just feel the vibrations in the audience of the crowd going, oh, I know that one, oh, I remember that one, I was there for that one, I remember that call. Ernieisms. Yeah, Ernieisms. And so uh, there's just something very um, positive about Ernie Harwell. And when you go and see this play, everyone walks out feeling just better about themselves, better about what a human being can be, better about nostalgia for baseball. I, I think a lot of people in modern times with a-Rod and guys like that, they've sort of lost or forgotten, is a better word, forgotten the romance they used to have with baseball, the days of the transistor radios under the pillows and, and going to see a game being so exciting. And that's a lot of what this play captures and recaptures. And I think that's why people feel like they visit a piece of their past when they spend 85 minutes with this play. I understand a majority of it, uh, if not the whole thing, takes place uh, on his final night speaking at Comerica Park in front of the Tiger Public fans. So uh, it was that an easy location for you to want to set this play up? Well, the one problem with Ernie Harwell as a subject for a play is that he has no conflict. And theater is about conflict, always. Uh, you know, somebody wants something from somebody else. So I had to sort of invent that. And the way that it works, and I think it ended up working beautifully, is on the last night that he's at Comerica Park, last night he's at a baseball game, he's going to give a speech, a thank you speech to the fans who are honoring him. He really didn't want to do it, I know that, I talked to him, but he goes anyhow because he's supposed to. While he's waiting in the tunnel and it's raining outside, um, a magical boy appears dressed in knickers and 1930s clothing, you know, much like where Ernie grew up, and starts to ask him about his life. And he's all over the stage and he's running around and he keeps saying, well, tell me, you know, do a broadcast. And he says, well, I don't broadcast anymore. Well, not a game, your life. 
my life. Yeah, broadcast your life. Tell me about your life. What was the first inning like? And so he ends up using the first inning as his childhood and the second inning as he got a little older and the third inning when he goes off to war and the fourth inning when he gets married and the fifth inning when he gets his first job and all that. So you have this wonderful back and forth with Ernie not wanting to be there, not wanting all this attention on himself, but a fan and a very energetic upbeat fan keeps asking him all these questions and so Ernie being too nice not to answer tells him basically his whole life and on these big giant screens behind the characters you see all this video from we have video from the 1926 World Series where Babe Ruth steals tries to steal second and is thrown out to end the World Series all the way up to Bobby Thompson shot heard around the world and Jackie Robinson and Willie Mays and the 68 Tigers and the 84 Tigers and Tiger Stadium it's always going on so it's like a dreamscape because you see all these visions and all these great images which Major League Baseball gave us because they love Ernie Harwell. So um, it, it just, it, it works as like first inning, second inning, third. you always know where you're at. Oh, we're on the fourth, we got five more innings to go and there's a big surprise in the ninth inning and uh, it's over in 85 minutes and uh, it, people just seem to love it. I mean, people in Detroit have actually gone and seen this show six, seven, and eight times. I, you know, you got me. I mean, I have to, you know, but uh, they do voluntarily and they bring their friends and they bring their parents and their kids and it seems like they want people to share the Ernie experience. So is that type of reaction and success from the show, is that what made you kind of want to branch out and specifically what made you want to bring it up here to Traverse City? Well, I, I, I should be honest, I always said that I would not take it out of Detroit, that it was a Detroit story and it was supposed to be there. We had offers to take it to New York and to take it to Florida and to St. Louis and a bunch of places and I said, no, if you want to see it, come to Detroit, you know, bring the money to Detroit, bring your bodies to catch Detroit. Game, yeah, Detroit. catch a Detroit Tigers ball game. But then I began to realize that maybe I was being a little silly uh, when it, it came to the state because Ernie Harwell didn't belong to the city of Michigan, or the city of Detroit. He belonged to the state of Michigan. And people in Traverse City adored him every bit as much as someone on Woodward Avenue. And so I thought, all right, maybe we should just soften the stance a little bit. And if there's places that it would make sense around the state, let's be open to that. And so this year we're doing two uh, off-site places to here in Traverse City and in East Lansing. That's it, just those two places and of course it's run in Detroit. And I'm very excited about it because this is summer. Traverse City in summer is alive and summer is baseball. This is the time to see this story. This is the, you know, people are already being nostalgic just by being up here because they came up here with their parents and now they're bringing their kids. It's the same thing with baseball. And you go in and you say, oh, yeah, I remember all that. And Ernie Harwell was part of my life. And now he can be part of my kid's life, whatever. So I, I think it's a very good fit. Now that I'm here, now that I got over my angst and worry about traveling the show and taking all the parts up and everything like that, um, it's perfect. I, I think it'll be just an ideal setting. Yeah, and you definitely, I think you touched on it. What's the unique thing about it? You have generations of people who grew up listening to him call ball games, and now for their kids who didn't have the chance to really hone in on his broadcast since he stepped down in 2002, 2003, uh, they get the chance to see this iconic figure that's going to live in Tiger lore forever right. through, through this play and through their far uh, parents' reinterpretation right. of his life. If you already know Ernie Harwell, then you come to see it because you want to find out more about him and you loved him and it's great to see him. If you never heard of Ernie Harwell, then you come because it's like, oh, so this is what the fuss is about, about this guy my parents talked about, my grandfather talked about. We've had people from Russia come and see the show. They don't even know what baseball is. And a woman stood up after one of the shows, she was crying. She said, I'm so moved. I don't know what this is baseball, but it's so moving, you know. So um, hopefully it works as a play, first and foremost. But it, it, if you know Ernie, or if you loved Ernie, or if your parents loved Ernie, your grandparents loved Ernie, if he's some name that's been in your in your wheelhouse for some reason, it's a great, it's a great play to see and it's pretty satisfying. You know, I, I, I have honestly seen this play over 200 times, easily, maybe 300. And I can sit through it and watch it and, and just slide into the guys because Peter Carey who plays Ernie, it's like seeing Ernie come back to life. And as someone who loved Ernie and knew Ernie for 25 years, he was a friend of mine for 25 years. So I did have conversations with him like they have on stage and to watch Peter bring him to life and to watch T.J. Corbett play this whirling dervish of a kid who just won't leave him alone, just keeps poking him and poking him. Yeah, tell me this, tell me this, tell me this. It's like Roadrunner and, and Coyote. Um, it's, it's delightful. I mean, these guys just are magical. And T.J. hasn't missed a show in five years. And um, Peter was the understudy for two years before he took over 
two years ago and hasn't missed a show since. So there's a lot of longevity and feeling and familiarity with these guys and it shows on stage. Definitely. Uh, you know, you've, you've had a remarkable career. I don't trying to get there. Remarkable career working uh, with the newspapers, writing, uh, and now developing into the theater world. Uh, safe to say, you know, I'm not going to pin you as saying the most accomplished thing you've ever done, but is this right up there as one of the most, uh, the proudest works you've ever uh, accomplished? Well, I've been blessed to be involved with a lot of different things, and surely Tuesdays with Maury was its own little world, and, uh, you know, Five People You Meet in Heaven, my first novel, and things like that, were, they were also their own little worlds. But I'd say for something that nobody was expecting, I didn't have a contract, I didn't have a theater waiting, I didn't have a publisher, I didn't have a newspaper. It was just something I just sat down and said, let's give this a try and it might have been a total waste of time I mean if nobody was interested in it I would have spent all that time doing it and and just would have put it in a drawer uh, to see it go from that down in my basement alone working on it to casting it to uh, putting the lighting and the sets to bringing it to Traverse City and to the knowledge that every single person involved with the play, which I had never done before, I'd never made a play before, I'd written them, but I never made one, but every single person from the stage manager to the lighting to the set designs to the actors is from Michigan, everyone. There's not an outsider in the, in the group. That was very, very satisfying. And I would say, yeah, from start to finish, uh, how it started and how it's finishing or ongoing, has been, yeah, might be the most, one of the most, if not the most satisfying thing I've ever created.